Rome, the eternal city, was not making a good case for eternity during the dark days of the 14th century. The popes were not even living here then. They had moved their headquarters to Avignon in France. Christian Rome had become provincial, lumbered only with the tokens of a great classical past. And yet this city was now about to embark on the most astonishing 200 years. Nowhere else has there ever been such a burst of artistic activity during one relatively short period. The turning point for Rome had come one day in 1420, when a new pope, Martin V, rode into the city with his retinue of cardinals and clerks, most of them on mules, and plenty of strongly armed retainers. He'd had a difficult journey. He'd been elected pope at a council in Germany, but so wild were the times, and so short of funds, the papal treasury, it had taken him three years to get here. Most of that time he spent in Florence, negotiating with the barons of central Italy to allow him to pass unmolested. But now at last, here he was. Rome was at the lowest ebb of her long history. There'd been no new building for a century or more. And the walls of the city were in such disrepair that sometimes wolves came in at night. They'd even been known to dig up the bodies newly buried in the Vatican Cemetery. The people were impoverished and lawless. The long-term task for the papacy was to reassert a position of leadership in Europe. More immediately, what Martin had to do was to give Rome sufficient wealth and power to hold her own among the warring factions of Italy and to bring back some order and decency into the life of the city. of a very familiar and reassuring kind in the form of plain chant was an everyday part of religious life, as it had been now for some 800 years. This music had hardly changed since its greatest period under Pope Gregory in the 6th century. Indeed, why should it change when the Holy Spirit had whispered into Gregory's ear that this was exactly how monks should sing the daily offices, enabling him to establish what became known as Gregorian chant. This form of singing remained the permanent background sound of the religious life, like the pleasant buzzing of insects on a summer's day. But for a special occasion, something much more elaborate would be provided. This is a motet by Dufay, which was commissioned in 1431 for the coronation of Martin's successor, Pope Eugenius IV. This music is written to a rigorous scheme, reminiscent of medieval systems of thought, and the degree of elaboration is extraordinary. The lower voices are singing two different melodies, each one six times over, 
while a third voice sings yet another tune three times in the same period, leaving the two top voices to concentrate on music, different yet again, which is fast moving and of great vigor. And verbally, the whole ensemble involves three different texts in addition to the words of the plain chant. It is hardly surprising that such departures from the plain and familiar had their opponents. In the previous century, when this style of music was new, an author had grumbled, they sing too lasciviously. They break, cut, and divide their voices into too many consonants. In the most inopportune places, they jump about on notes, howling like dogs. Like madmen nourished by disorderly and twisted aberrations, they use a harmony alien to nature itself. But the Bishop of Chartres felt that this might well be the sound of heaven. Such music, he argued, transports the soul to the society of angels. The reign of Eugenius IV, which had begun with that music, was itself somewhat turbulent. Indeed, at one point, the people of Rome chased him from the city. But under his scholarly successor, Nicholas V, Rome settled down in 1447 to the business of transforming herself once again into the artistic center of Europe. It was the great collection of manuscripts gathered by Nicholas V, which became the basis of the Vatican Library. And in the next century, this superb room was built to house the books in great cupboards along the base of the walls. Nowadays, in the age of paperbacks and public libraries, a hundred books, or even a thousand, doesn't seem that many. But then, when a manuscript took months to write, and as likely as not, years to illuminate, it was an astonishing achievement that early in his reign, Nicholas V had collected no less than 350 manuscripts. And a few years later, he increased that number to more than a thousand. Once the collection existed, later popes added to it and cherished it. And since the Roman Catholic Church was the greatest single patron of music, the Vatican Library naturally developed into the world's most important collection of musical manuscripts. Such manuscripts are a rich source of information for scholars and for the rest of us, thanks to the excellent habit of decorating the more precious of them, a feast to the eye. Some of the largest manuscripts are of simple plain chant. Far too unwieldy for use in a choir stall, these were intended from the start to take their place among the glorious objects in cathedral treasuries, where books like this can still often be seen today. Here was another way, though mute in itself, of singing the praises of God. Strangely, the best music written in Rome in the 15th century was not by Italians. The leading composers had made a long journey south in search of patronage, coming mainly from northern France and the Netherlands. That was true of Dufay and of many other musicians in Rome up to the end of the 16th century. The most distinguished of the composers arriving from northern Italy in the late 15th century was Josquin des Prés, who wrote this music at the express command of a pope. 
in the visual arts, it was exclusively Italians who were supplying the needs of the popes, who now systematically set the best artists of the Renaissance to the task of embellishing Rome. The scale of the operation, which would soon become colossal, was at first very intimate, exquisitely so in this tiny private chapel in the Vatican, decorated for Nicholas V by Fra Angelico. Here the Pope would come for his private prayers or to celebrate mass with a few select colleagues. One of the paintings shows an early pope giving the treasures of the church to St. Lawrence so that he may distribute them to the poor. Happily for Vatican finances, the treasures of the church were now building up, helped by the jubilee year of 1450, when vast crowds of pilgrims brought wealth to Rome. And all the old sources of revenue were now flowing once again into the Vatican coffers, as control was re-established over the territories round Rome, known as the Papal States. This painting by Lorenzetti, designed to show a well-governed community, dates from a century earlier. But peaceful agricultural effort of this kind, in those parts of central Italy belonging to Rome, was still the main source of papal wealth. There were taxes on pasture, on the movement of cattle and grain, on the provision of salt and of military protection. There were taxes on Jews, there were fines on wrongdoers, and fees of all kinds every time appointments were made. Such was the income of popes as the temporal rulers in central Italy, added to which dues for the church could be levied on rulers of other Christian nations. One way or another, there was money available and the popes were making spectacular use of it. The Sistine Chapel, started in 1473, and shown here before Michelangelo had painted the ceiling, was the first great work in the rebuilding of Rome. Sixtus IV, who founded the chapel, now known by his name, established also a papal choir to sing in it, the Sistine Choir, and Josquin des Prés was a member of the choir for about 12 years. During much of that time, his patron was the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI, one of whose sons was commemorated in music by Josquin. Other popes had had children, but Alexander was the only one to make a habit of it. The occasion for Josquin's piece was dramatic. Alexander's eldest son was found dead in the Tiber. He was one of at least eight children acknowledged by the Pope, and in his unexplained murder, scandal and tragedy were inseparable. When the body of the Pope's son was dragged from the murky waters of the river with nine dagger wounds, it seemed to contemporaries the most shocking event in a papal reign which has come to symbolize all that was shocking about the Renaissance papacy. The young man, he was 21, had recently led the Pope's army against a powerful local family, so the murder could have been political. But equally, he was notorious for a very active nightlife. The culprit could have been an outraged husband. It was never discovered who had done the deed. A timber merchant did later admit that he had seen five men bring a body and fling it into the Tiber. But when asked why he hadn't reported it at the time, he said that over the years he'd seen hundreds of bodies thrown into the river. He hadn't thought anything of it at the time. Such was 15th century Rome. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Josquin's lament for the death in the Pope's family sets the words of the Bible in which King David mourns his own favorite son. In this new measured style with its more sinuous vocal line, Josquin gives himself breathing space to express deep human emotion, so bringing music more into step with the visual arts. At this period, the High Renaissance, when the Popes were about to commission some of the world's greatest masterpieces.
The death of his son plunged the Pope into a repentant frame of mind. For a while, reform and self-denial were the words of the moment, but it didn't last. Four years after the tragedy, an extraordinary party was given in the Vatican by the Pope's best-known son, Cesare Borgia. The Pope was there, so was his daughter, Lucrezia. And the occasion is described in somewhat tight-lipped fashion, in a secret diary kept by the Pope's Master of Ceremonies. There were in attendance, he said, 50 respectable prostitutes known as courtesans. After supper, they danced first closed and then unclothed. And then the candles were taken from the table and put on the floor and chestnuts scattered among them for the naked courtesans to crawl around, picking them up. Finally, the master of ceremonies confided to his diary there were prizes given, such as silk doublets and hats, to those of the male servants who could perform most often with the courtesans. Well, such a party, even with a pope present, can confidently be described as secular. And it raises the interesting question of what sort of music Cesare Borgia would have considered appropriate for the occasion. What was the secular music of the time? Although wind instruments would have been used at a noisy party, the latest sound for serious music was that of the viol, which was now making possible a new range of musical pleasures. You've got to work the grain you know, in certain ways, otherwise. Each vial had to be painstakingly carved and shaped from intractable looking planks of wood. For centuries, there have been string instruments of various kinds played with a bow. But this vial family, more delicate and subtle than their predecessors, had been developed only in the 15th century in Spain. Indeed, there may have been a direct link with the Borgia family who came from Spain. It seems likely that they brought vial players with them to Italy and so helped to establish the instrument in Rome. The vials were lighter in construction and less tautly strung than their later cousins of the violin family, which would eventually replace them. Like the violins, they came in the various sizes needed to reflect the full range of the human voice, from treble to bass. But each size of viol was played with the body of the instrument held downwards, like a cello. This is uh, figured sycamore, maple and sycamore, very similar in looks. And quite often you can't tell the difference, but this is figured sycamore. This is the figure going across this way these bands and the grain goes this way, likewise. It's all book matched, which means that this is one piece of wood cut in half, joined down the middle. So this is exactly the same, or the next piece of wood to this. And likewise, the ribs are book matched in the same way. This is uh, cut in half to make this wood. And likewise, this one and this one and this one and this one. So everything on the instrument, the tensions are all equal. The arrival of the viol meant that instrumental music could now provide the pleasure of interweaving lines of melody, previously possible only with the human voice. Music written for four voices would now also be considered suitable for playing on four viols. Indeed, the presence of words on a surviving manuscript may often be the only indication that a composer intended his piece for singing. Today, with the growing interest in music performed on the correct period instruments, viols are once again being made, imitating as accurately as possible those instruments which have survived. And so, once again, there can exist what the English called a consort of viols the origin of our modern word concert. Here was the predecessor of what would become the most familiar vehicle for serious chamber music, the string quartet.
Musical instruments of the time feature prominently in the decorations done for Alexander VI's own study in the Vatican. The painter was Pinturicchio and his theme, the liberal arts. Just as musicians in Rome were now providing pieces which could be either played or sung, so the city's religious music for special occasions was also becoming more adaptable. Previously, any new work had only been performed once on the occasion it was written for. Now, masses were being composed for use whenever something out of the ordinary might be required, such as this one by Josquin des Prés. Here were the beginnings of something we now take for granted, a standard repertoire. Upon the ruins of ancient Rome, there were rising the structures of the Renaissance city. The classical past was the age to which people now looked for inspiration. And anyway, the architects were not going to waste such sturdy foundations. The base here is a theater founded by Julius Caesar himself. Crowning it, like a capped tooth, but considerably more secure, is a 16th century palace. In new building, it was naturally the popes who were giving the lead. It was in 1506 that Julius II laid the foundation stone for the great new basilica of St. Peter's. The vast project would take less than a century to complete, and its architects would include such names as Raphael and Michelangelo. Though when Michelangelo showed this model of the proposed building to the Pope, it was many years after his most famous work in the Vatican. In the year 1512, just a hundred yards or so from here, Michelangelo was on his back finishing his ceiling in the Sistine Chapel, while in this room, 
Raphael was beginning a new series of frescoes. The subjects have a clear political message. They show scenes from the past which have been chosen to illustrate, by analogy, the achievements of the present day Pope. And to emphasize the point, the Pope in each historical scene has the face of his modern counterpart, which enables us to date the frescoes very precisely. The kneeling Pope on the wall above is a portrait of Michelangelo's great patron, Julius II, the Pope who also first employed Raphael in the Vatican. But Julius died early in 1513. And so the Pope on this wall has the face of his successor, Leo X. He was just as eager as Julius to continue the great work of creating a glorious Rome, and he appreciated as keenly the genius of Raphael, not only keeping him on at work in these rooms, but also appointing him the architect of the new St. Peter's, and meanwhile sitting for his own portrait. Like nearly all the popes at this time, who were great patrons of art, Leo was a member of one of Italy's princely families, in his case the Medici. A typically swift rise through the ranks of the church was made by a member of another princely family, the Farnese, who became pope as Paul III. He had been made a cardinal at the tender age of 25, largely because his mother was having an affair with Pope Alexander VI, and it was he who began building a great palace outside Rome at Caprarola. The Farnese family would come out here to Caprarolo in the summer to enjoy cooler air in the hills. And if visitors are impressed by the scale of this grand design, it is relevant that no clear distinction was made at the time between the income of the papacy and that of the Pope himself. A little extravagance was inevitable, and certainly part of the attraction of the job. But it was also a measure of the new security of the Papal States that a fortune could now be safely spent on a great house some 50 miles from Rome without serious fortifications. This is definitely a palace rather than a castle, and it is decorated throughout in palatial style with some very specifically up-to-date murals. This splendid room at Caprarola, known for obvious reasons as the Map Room, reflects the new 16th century view of our planet, which had been much expanded in recent years. On a map of the previous century, moving west across the Atlantic, the first landmass would have been Asia, with India looming rather larger than China. But then in 1492, the year when the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI, was elected, Christopher Columbus sailed westwards looking for a shorter route to India. Instead, no surprise to us, he discovered America. And in his capacity as Pope, Alexander VI divided any newfound lands between the two great seafaring Roman Catholic nations, Spain and Portugal. And he did so by a very simple device. He just drew a line straight down through the Atlantic, and he said all discoveries to the west of that line would go to Spain, and all to the east to Portugal. By the east, he meant the Far East, India, and beyond where the Portuguese had been exploring. What nobody knew at the time was that the Pope's line had just nicked the eastern coast of South America. So giving the Portuguese a foothold there, and years later, moving inland, the whole of mighty Brazil. But for the moment, the wealth of America had fallen into Spanish hands in the gold and silver of Mexico and Bolivia and Peru. This was brought back to Spain and so enriched all Europe, and indirectly the Pope and his cardinals. This building is evidence of that. Now, if a princely cardinal were entertaining on a lavish scale in a room such as this, his first choice for the music would probably be wind instruments, because they were louder than any others. They could compete with the noise of a good party. He could also have music from vials. But if the occasion was more intimate, providing pleasant entertainment for an evening at home, the natural choice was the lute.
Paul III, when not busy with his building program at Caprarola, was continuing in Rome the great project which he had inherited from his predecessors. This was the stage which St. Peter's had reached by the 1540s. During the 16th century, music was becoming more widely available in printed form. And like all early printing, which had to justify itself by comparison with manuscripts, the results were magnificent. This is a collection of masses published in 1516 by the first printer of music in Rome, Antico. The woodcut on the title page shows him presenting his book to the Pope, Leo X. And the pages of music themselves are superbly ornamented with ornate capital letters. This was for performance in church, but the arrival of printed music made even more difference to the spread of new secular music. This is a collection of madrigals dating from 1584 by the most published composer of that time, Lassus. The music is divided into four separate parts, one for each singer. Relatively few people in the 16th century could have appreciated music of this sophistication. The text of madrigals is of a high literary standard based on poets like Petrarch, and the music is arranged for unaccompanied voices. But for those who did enjoy such subtleties, the arrival of printing made them much more readily available. Amateurs could go out and buy these sheets and then gather together informally, men and women, to make music for their own pleasure. Or professionals could use them to provide entertainment, at a banquet perhaps, or in the intervals of a play. And that was likely to be the way in which the music of Lassus would be heard in the household of a rich Roman cardinal. In the countryside, some 20 miles east of Rome, stands the most spectacular villa and garden of all those created by the rich prelates of the Renaissance. It is the villa at Tivoli, built in the 1550s for Cardinal d'Este, who was a grandson of Pope Alexander VI. Here, among these pleasant hills, the best musicians of the day would come to delight the Cardinal and his guests. Among them was the leading writer of that increasingly sophisticated form of entertainment, the Madrigal. He was Marenzio, who wrote in all some 600 madrigals. Marenzio, in his madrigals, takes every opportunity for a startling effect, sometimes in the relationship between the voices or in musical puns, such as a rising phrase where the lyric talks of a hill, or even a pair of large round notes in the score when the loved one's eyes are mentioned. This constant striving for effect was very much in keeping with the style of the time in other arts, now known by the overall name of mannerism. Oh. 
Madrigals would be only one of the many musical forms on offer when the cardinal was entertaining. The exact nature and variety of the music would depend on the level of the entertainment, and with this particular cardinal that could be very grand indeed. Many years before Cardinal d'Este had moved into this villa at Tivoli, he had given one of the most sumptuous banquets of the century. He was only 20 at the time, not yet a cardinal, he was Archbishop of Milan. But the entertainment was so lavish that when the chief steward of the d'Este family later came to write a book on how to organize a banquet, he put this one at the top of his list, describing all the events of the day with details of the food and the music to give his readers an idea of a really good party. There were about 50 guests, and they spent the morning outside in a kind of tournament. The ladies watched while the gentlemen tilted at a ring. The archbishop would be as proud as any other young man of his skill on a horse. They came indoors at about two, and during the afternoon, some actors performed a farce, while in the garden, the steward and his army of servants were preparing the surprises of the banquet. These included a specially built leafy bower from which dancers and musicians would appear. It was 10 o'clock before the guests were finally ushered into the garden, and then, by the light of flaming torches, they had their first glimpse of the great banqueting table. It was decorated with gold and silver and glass and flowers, and with 15 statues, each about two feet high, five of Venus, five of Cupid, and five of Bacchus, all made of sugar. It was to be a fish banquet, no meat at all, but an incredible variety of seafood with all sorts of vegetables and pasta and soups and fruit. And the music was as varied as the food. To give a few examples, during the first course, three trombones and three cornetti played. For the third, it was harp, harpsichord and recorder. For the sixth, unaccompanied singers. For the eighth, wind and strings while two entertainers played tricks. With the ninth course, the guests thought that the party was over because the servants came and lifted up the huge tablecloth with all its cutlery and glass and flowers and the sugar cupids and carted it off. But there was another tablecloth already laid underneath and immediately the servants placed more glass and cutlery and flowers and this time not sugar cupids but 15 statues of moors made of some dark edible paste, presumably a kind of marzipan. Eight male and seven female, the steward tells us and wherever decency required, flowers were stuck upon them. And so on up to the 17th course, which had the most elaborate music yet. Six singers, six viols, six wind, two keyboard instruments. By now, it was five in the morning. The archbishop gave a present to each of his guests, and off they went home, surely well satisfied. A night to remember. <laughs> Tivoli has one much greater claim to a place in musical history than its link with Marenzio. The lived here for several years in the 1560s in the service of Cardinal d'Este, the man whose achievement would provide the climax to the long development of Italian Renaissance music. 
Unlike so many of his predecessors, he was Italian born. And he is known today by the name of his hometown, Palestrina. It seems a small town now, partly because it has changed so little since the childhood days of its favorite son. No doubt, like many musical children from small communities near Rome, which is only 20 miles away, Palestrina spent several of his early years away from here, singing in the choirs of various Roman churches. But when his voice broke, he came back, and surprisingly, this was no bad place to develop a career in music. It was a very ancient town, important enough to have its own cathedral. That meant also its own bishop, and there was always the chance that he might be promoted, carrying his favorite musicians with him up the ladders of preferment. And that was exactly what happened to Palestrina. The bishop here became pope in 1550 as Julius III. Palestrina followed him to Rome, and there he would bring to a smooth and seamless perfection the Renaissance style of polyphony, music with many melodic lines. As treated by Palestrina, this quite difficult form was to remain a familiar feature in European music. Even four centuries later, in faraway Wales, when Organ Morgan is asked in Under Milkwood who he likes best, he replies, O Bach, without a doubt, and then Palestrina. Palestrina joined the papal establishment in Rome in 1551. By that time, Michelangelo was the architect in charge of the new St. Peter's. And when Michelangelo died, the building had got up to the top of the drum, that's just above the columns, with as yet no dome in place above it. Apart from a few brief interruptions, as when he was in charge of music at the Villa d'Este, Palestrina worked here in Rome for nearly half a century, composing more than a hundred masses and much else besides. He was the best known, but also the most closely linked with Rome of the various composers who are now bringing to a peak of elegance the polyphonic tradition of church music with its interweaving vocal lines. When Palestrina died in 1594, the great dome of St. Peter's was at last in place. It had just been completed. A little less than two centuries had passed since Martin V had returned to an impoverished city. During that period, in architecture, in art and in music, the popes had developed a new Rome, expressing to perfection the grandeur of the Roman Catholic Church. The chief characteristic of Palestrina is his effortless texture, as short phrases are taken up by each voice in turn. His music has been used for three centuries as the basis for the study of counterpoint. Yet his famous smoothness may have been in his own time more apparent than real. He was writing for the Sistine Choir, and their style of singing involved a great deal of elaboration. Here, in a rare performance on film, today's Sistine Choir, larger than its Renaissance equivalent, sings in St. Peter's part of Palestrina's Mass of Pope Marcellus. <laughs> <laughs> 